Catherine Mitchell, I'm the Dean of the Social Sciences, and it is my great pleasure to introduce the proceedings tonight. Tonight is the fifth and final of our panel sessions highlighting the naming of College 10 for Representative John R. Lewis and celebrating his wonderful legacy. These panel sessions will be followed by a spring dedication event on May 6th, which Pro Provost Flora Liu and Senior Director of Student Life, Sarah Woodside Burry, will tell you a bit more about later in the program. So I'd like to begin uh, this, our proceedings today with a land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking Yupi tribe, the Ama Mutsun tribal band, comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. As some of you may know, colleges nine and 10 have long held a special relationship with the social sciences. We hold the same fundamental values. These include attention to community partnerships as well as global events and circumstances, concern about relationships inside and outside the university and a commitment to working towards social justice in many different registers. Additionally, we're drawn to research and instruction that engages the politically and socially relevant questions of the day and faculty, students, and staff who think about equitable and just ways to approach those questions and imagine and work towards structural and sustainable solutions. The panel session today uh, on students as agents of transformative change fits perfectly in these traditions. Students demand more of us as they should. It is through their constant advocacy and pressure that we are forced to resist the lure of inertia and the status quo, and to consider alternative ways of thinking about and imagining future systems and relationships. These are also the values of John R. Lewis, who at great personal cost, constantly pressured many systems at many scales, all the way to Congress to rethink, reimagine and rework the status quo and to demand social, racial and economic justice and equity. This event tonight, which is brought to you by colleges nine and 10 and the Institute for Social Transformation, units under the Division of Social Sciences, is a testament to all of the important work students do in calling out injustice and inequity, demanding change, and offering their own visions and practices for greater community well being for all. Thank you again for joining us this evening for panel five of Necessary Trouble thinking with the legacy of John R. Lewis. So I'm, I'm now going to invent, uh, welcome up uh, Provost Liu and um, student director Woodside Burry to the stand. Thank you, Dean Mitchell. And good afternoon. I'm Flora Liu. I'm the provost of College 9 and College 10, soon to be named John R. Lewis College. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Woodside Burry, and I'm the Senior Director of College Student Life here at College 9 and College 10. Together, Flora and I co-lead College 9 and College 10, soon to be John R. Lewis College. Our partnership across the academic and student life side reflect unique living and learning community that is the college system on our campus. At College 10, our theme is social justice and community and it imbues all that we do. And it's closely um, describes the guiding values of John Lewis. It feels very fitting then that we culminate this series, Necessary Trouble, thinking with the legacy of John R. Lewis with a focus of students as agents of transformative change, both on this campus and in our society. This Necessary Trouble series has been a partnership between colleges nine and 10, the Institute for Social Transformation, the Division of Social Sciences, as Catherine mentioned, and the Center for Racial Justice. The Center for Racial Justice has taken the lead in organizing tonight's event, and we are extremely appreciative of all of their efforts to bring us all together today. John Lewis's experiences and accomplishments as a student exemplify this idea of transformation. 
he attended the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee, because there was no tuition required. Instead, students worked on on-campus jobs in exchange for education, room, and board. In September of 1957, as he began college, John Lewis described himself as, quote, nervous and unsure, very alone, very out of place, and very conscious of having grown up on a poor rural farm. He found his calling in what he called the social gospel, confronting the realities of suffering that people encountered every day. As a student, John Lewis tried to start a chapter of the NAACP at ABT where he was. He first corresponded with and then met the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He learned nonviolent civil disobedience from Jim Lawson. He co-led desegregation efforts such as sit-ins at lunch counters and boycotts of stores. He formed what would then become known as the Student Nonviolent Co Coordinating Committee or SNCC. John Lewis turned 21 years old in jail. He missed his own graduation so that he could participate in the Freedom Rides. He knew the power of student movements on college campuses. He and other members of the Nashville Student Movement traveled to up north to places like Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan to meet with student orgs on those campuses to conduct workshops and to inspire many others to join the movement. As we all know, the work continues. One of the great joys of being faculty and staff at UC Santa Cruz is witnessing the transformations of our students as leaders, scholars, and agents of change. This campus draws students who are deeply committed, passionate, and inspiring. Traits our presenters possess in spades. So we'd just like to share a few details about the proceedings this afternoon. Um, first, we're gonna start with opening remarks by our um, esteemed moderator, Xavier Liverman, as well as lightning talks by all of our wonderful panelists, after which there'll be a moderated discussion between our moderator and all of the panelists, followed by question and answer from all of us as the audience, both here in the room and online on Zoom. And we would love to continue centering students for that Q&A uh, portion. So if you are a student online, when you write your question, please indicate that you're a student so that we can get to your question first. And for those of you in the room who identify as students, feel free to just raise your hand unabashedly um, and we'll get to your questions um, when the time comes. Um, today's event will be recorded, so for those of you who miss out on all the amazing things that folks are going to have to say, we'll post it on our website afterwards. Um, and again, for the in-person attendees here this evening or this afternoon, we'd love for you to join us for tabling after the event. We had a little bit of tabling before the event, um, but there's an incredible uh, group of organizations here to table uh, so folks can get involved right away. So please join us for that. I now have the pleasure of introducing the moderator of our event tonight, UC Santa Cruz's Associate Professor Xavier Liverman, Faculty of Feminist Studies, Director of the Black Studies Minor, and member of the Advisory Board of John Lewis College. Professor Liverman's research addresses issues of race, gender, sexuality, and artistic expression, exploring the lives of Black queer youth, and their creativity, vibrancy, and efforts to create other worlds. He has recently published his book, Kuwaito Bodies, Remastering Space and Subjectivity in Post-Apartheid South Africa, published in 2020, Duke University Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Xavier Liverman. Thank you. Um. Oh, of course that would happen. Sorry, folks. My mic just fell right off. <laughs> um, thankfully, we have a little extra time because sadly, one of our um, speakers was unable to make it today. Okay, I'm gonna need some help, sorry. <laughs> oops, 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 oops. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Sorry about that delay. All right, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I want to start by saying that I want to thank Dean Mitchell, Flora, and Sarah for coming and giving us these wonderful introductions um, for our series today. Um, I also want to thank each of the speakers. I'm going to first and foremost um, just ask people to turn their attention to the program for full bios on the speakers. This is just in the interest of time to make sure that we don't take um, too much time with the sort of introductory remarks and we give everyone enough time uh, to be able to say what they were planning on saying for today. I'm gonna keep my remarks brief in that spirit. Um, first of all, I just wanna start by picking up on something from Dean Mitchell's um, um, introduction when we talk about issues of social equity. Um, and we often talk about the ways that students push forward um, certain kinds of institutional and societal change um, that we're not always ready for. And I think that that's where I wanna kind of start and open things up because I think that as students, um, oftentimes students are the ones who are pushing us. They're the ones who have the more capacious imagination. Um, they're also the ones who I don't think have been as jaded, right, by experience. And so there's that belief that things can change. There's that belief that um, if you organize and you work together and you create forms of solidarity that you can um, create the kinds of change that you would like to see. Um, I also think that um, while we tend to make a lot about the distinction between the town and the gown or between the ivory tower and real life, um, the reality is that our students come from real life. You know, they come from the town before they were in the gown. They come from outside the ivory, the ivory tower before they come into the ivory tower. And so I think that oftentimes students are in this position of having seen things in their communities and injustices and um, and then seeing those injustices replicated, um, you know, in the institution that they may have thought, oh, I wasn't expecting to see that here as well, right? And I think that that galvanizes um, quite a bit of activism and quite a bit of um, notions of change. And so, um, sorry, I'm just going to say, I want to also think about the ways that then we as an institution, particularly those of us who are interested in questions of student affairs, those of us who are interested in, who are faculty, those of us who are staff, those of us who basically have that job of supporting students through their journey here, um, how we can actually support the, the kinds of initiatives and change that students are asking for. Um, and I think one way that I know that I help to do that and that I hope that we have instituted is through our political education that we do. And I think that that's happening both through colleges nine and 10, um, but also through critical race and ethnic studies. And I think that one of the things that I want to um, talk about is that the, the gaining of the Department of Critical Race and Ethnic Studies um, is because of student activism and literally the people sitting here in front of you today. <laughs> um, yeah. So I know that sometimes things can seem intractable and there were 50 years of struggle for ethnic studies on this campus, but these are students who in some cases are still here and in some cases were here only about a decade ago. And that is change. That is something different that's happening institutionally that wasn't happening before. So I think that that gives us an opportunity to think with our imaginations, but also with a slight bit of optimism, even as we are dealing with a number of crises right now about what kinds of transformative change students can be a part of. Um, I'd just like to end with um, one final night. Elias, um, who is on the program, um, was not able to join us today, but I think that um, there's a bit of controversy about a, a picture that um, he had chosen to place on the flyer that um, was in offering up support of cops off campus. And I wanted to mention it really briefly because I think that's a perfect example right, of where students are leading the charge and where perhaps folks that are in power are a little more uncomfortable with that, right? Um, and that's about the imagination that students have that we can have a world without uh, policing or that at the very least we can have a university without policing, right? And I think any of you who saw the horrible events in, in New York yesterday can attest to the fact that 
um, we're living in a situation where we're calling for more and more police, and yet the police that are there are generally trained toward, um, you know, trying to basically get at minor level offenses by people who are poor and disadvantaged, right? Rather than actually maybe preventing something like hap like what happened yesterday. And I think that those are the kinds of changes and imagination that um, that oftentimes young people are at the forefront of, of saying, look, let's look at the evidence. The evidence doesn't seem to be bearing out that this is something that's helpful for us as a society. Let's try to think about something different. And we understand how intractable the common sense around that issue is um, to this extent that literally that seems to be the only solution we have to every social problem. Um, but I think that our students are letting us know that we can have other kinds of solutions to our social problems. And so um, as we, as I'm getting ready to kind of turn things over um, to the panelists, I just want to emphasize that we're going to hear some really amazing stories about activism, about um, ways in which students did activism while they were students, but also how they brought themselves into the space and worked to transform the space, but also how they've taken that knowledge and moved outside of the space with that knowledge. And I think there's something there for each of us to be able to take. Um, so I encourage folks to you know, be ready for questions, comments, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So I'm going to um, stop here and turn things over to Chris. Great, thank you, Xavier. <clears throat> You mentioning the, um, that it was a 50 year struggle for uh, ethnic studies kind of threw me for a loop because I'm still stuck in my like 2011 brain where it's like 40 years ago or 40 years of struggle and I'm having like a little existential crisis on stage while I'm getting, no I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I'm, hi everyone, my name is Chris. Uh, I am from Inglewood, California. I attended UC Santa Cruz uh, from 2008 to 2013. Um, and I've been invited to talk about my experiences um, as a kind of as a passive protester and then later on also as like an organizer um, for ethnic studies. Um, it's really powerful to be here today to speak on history, knowing that uh, a part of our demands have, have manifested, to know that these um, new sites of struggle have emerged and that um, that was only the, the beginning of a new phase in the struggle for ethnic studies. Um, so it's, it's a big honor to be here. Um, I may get emotional at some point. Um, I hope y'all are okay with that. Um, but yeah, many of us came together um, mostly out of the sole reason that we wanted to accomplish something while we were here. We wanted to um, achieve something material because we understood that our oppression was material and not necessarily um, just this abstract concept of what we experience, but actually a reflection of like the processes that exist throughout the world that manufacture that oppression and that maintain it. Um, we came together as a collective of autonomous students, and I would really like to emphasize the word autonomous. We explicitly were not connected to any official student organization, um, mostly so our actions could not be connected to those organizations, so there could not be um, unfair consequences inflicted on spaces that we loved and cared about. Um, I'm going to speak a lot about the value of autonomous student organizing, um, and no way is that, um, you know, to, to speak negatively on um, official student organizations. Um, I have my own critiques of them, um, but I also see the value of them. Um, shout out Rainbow Theater. Um, I'm a part of that. Uh, <laughs> El Centro, I was also an intern there. Um, but yeah, so first I'd actually like to set up a little context of kind of the political climate, the protests and the actions that were happening. It was the fall of 2009 and there were students across the globe who were occupying different spaces on their campuses, who were protesting against austerity measures, against budget cuts to departments, to resources, to teaching and service staff. And so the kind of tactic of the time became occupations. Um, and UC Santa Cruz was no different. In the winter or the fall of 2009, um, we had an occupation of Kerr Hall, the administrative building for three days until um, students were removed by force from the police. Um, and 
occupation was kind of coming along with this political ethos that was emerging that was like occupy everything demand nothing and a part of that kind of philosophy at the time um, was trying to point out that there was no institution there was no seat of power that was able to actually give us what we were demanding and so the, the actual thought and idea of demanding something seemed um, almost futile um, and so we were asking for the world to stop. We, we saw the financial crisis of 2008. We saw all these ne neoliberal policies start to emerge and take form. And we saw the ways in which um, we as students were being um, funneled into uh, more debt um, while also having less resources. And so um, for us, um, it was kind of this desire to stop what was happening, um, you know, in the words of uh, Mario Savio, to put up our bodies on the gears, upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon the apparatus. Um, and so this became, again, the dominant tactic, and it's where I met many of my future collaborators at these kinds of actions, these kinds of spaces. Um, and it was in the turmoil of student-led occupations where we not only survived the state's violence, um, but also the ignorance of our own privileged comrades who couldn't see or hear us as students of color. And so many of us participated in these spaces to different capacities because um, it was a period of, of invigorated student movement. But at the same time, we were having this experience where our concerns as students of color were being sidelined. Um, we were being gaslit and oftentimes um, our concerns were being tacked on to demands um, kind of as a way to appease us, but not as a real genuine investment in what our um, struggle was. And so we turned to each other realizing that this larger General Assembly was not for us, it was too messy and it was too unfocused. And so we decided that we wanted to gather as a small group of uh, students with an intention to organize for a specific goal. And what we realized is that we needed to educate ourselves on the history of student movements on this campus. We created a study group, we learned about the history and we, it became clear that one of the consistent demands was demanding for a college of ethnic studies. One of the consistent demands was trying to imagine a more rigorous site of inquiry. And so we decided that that is what we were gonna orient ourselves to. We chose not to name our group because we didn't want to get into the politics of belonging, of what it meant to have to be a part or a member of this organization. We wanted people to understand that we were creating a space to organize towards a specific goal that was material. Um, we didn't want to occupy everything and demand nothing. We wanted a very specific um, uh, approach to what we were doing. And our philosophy was that we needed to do that autonomously. We needed to do that with a small group of people. We needed to educate ourselves and we needed to be willing to um, agitate, be willing to inflict actual political consequences and being willing to actually disrupt what was going on in ways that also demanded something very specific. And so on March 2nd, 2011, we gathered a rally of our allies of close to three to 400 people. And at the end of the rally, we led our um, allies into the Ethnic Resource Center. And this is where we were released our manifesto. This is where we released our demands. And we specifically chose a different rhetorical approach. And instead of using the language of occupation, we use the language of retreat. Because what does it mean for historically occupied people, for historically oppressed people who have been the victims of occupation to utilize that tactic um, in a space that isn't designed for us? And um, it was the direction of Christine Hong who pointed us towards the language of critical race and ethnic studies that shaped the foundation of what we were moving towards. Um, but it also helped us understand that this university has a bomb shelter approach to diversity, that we carve out spaces of safety for people of color to move into and then feel safe instead of changing the larger campus community culture. And so we use the language of retreat to highlight that there are so few spaces of safety and also chose the ethnic resource centers because of what we felt was its ethical responsibility to us as students of color and also to demonstrate that if everyone who is represented by the ERCs try to utilize it all at once it is insufficient physical space for us and that's my time
Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gabi Isayom Danan. Uh, let me start off with a quick quote here. So we are living today in a world of crises marked by rapid emergence of the new and the rabid resistance of the old. The unfulfilled aspirations of the nation and the masses throb in the hearts and minds of the young. This generation strives to recoup the failures of the past and girds for the triumph of the future. I start off this quote from Filipino poet and revolutionary Jose Maria Sison because it summarizes well the role and responsibility that our generation has to society. It says that the unfulfilled aspirations of the nation and the masses throb in our very hearts. It's not dismissing us as silly, as idealistic. It's stating that we have the ability to imagine and to put into practice a new world. It is simply a call to action and the time for change is now. I felt this same call to action as a student at UC Santa Cruz. My first fall quarter, I saw a white supremacist fascist gain presidency. As students flooded the streets in anger and protest, I froze still thinking where my place was. What worth did my education have if the very people in my queer, Filipino, neurodiverse, immigrant, et cetera, communities were at risk of danger right now? The first step to building any movement is political education. I took a class called P Philippinex Historical Dialogue, or PhD, the first time that my Filipino identity and history was ever explicitly discussed. I felt that it was my call to action, and I took up teaching the class myself while facilitating its transition to the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department with the help of Professor Christine Wong. I shared my personal, my political education with my community, and it was incredibly empowering and personal experience. However, this political education was not enough. I felt frozen again. What was I going to do with all this knowledge of my people's rich history of resistance and its current political problems? I decided that my education and my skills did not belong to myself, but actually belong to society. I needed a collective of like-minded Filipinos dedicated to the liberation of our people. In my sophomore year, me and other Kasamas founded Anakbayan Santa Cruz, a militant anti-imperialist and Filipino youth and student organization that I can proudly say is the strongest it's ever been today. Thank you. Furthermore, in my senior year, I founded Gabriela Santa Cruz an organization of Filipino women and gender non-conforming folks who also fight against the three basic problems of society. Today, I work with PAWIS, a Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants, to provide resources, legal advice, and community to the Filipino workers, mostly caregivers in the Santa Clara County. If this happens to interest you, we have a summer internship opportunity that you can learn more about at our table. So anyway, you might be wondering to yourself, why should I care about what's going on in the Philippines? Why does this relate to me? It's some archipelago nation in Southeast Asia. Why, Mac, why are you talking about it? So a brief history lesson. The Philippines was the first country in all of Asia to revolt against a colonial power, that being Spain. However, America took over as the colonial power, and it hasn't really ever left since the turn of the 20th century. But since the 70s, an incredibly robust history of student organizing has been pushing the forefront of Philippine society, even toppling a US-backed dictator in the 80s. So the common narrative is that the third world has much to learn from us from Americans, but the reality is, is that we have a lot to learn from the political practice of the third world. The anti-imperialist struggle, which is one that our, the organizations Anak Bayan and Gabriela fight for, this is a struggle that interrelates with all because it addresses the root of our economic system. We live in American empire that is constantly plundering the rest of the world for oil, 
for resources and for labor for our own comfort. Therefore, if you create discomfort in the system, whether you're demanding accessible and informed health care, if you're holding your local police department accountable, or if you're providing mutual aid to your houseless neighbors, you are relating to an international anti-imperialist struggle. That being said, political education is so, so important, yes. But it is just as important to put these theories into practice, to integrate into our communities and learn how we can be of service to them. To be a revolutionary is to serve the people. It is to know their everyday struggles, but also help link those everyday struggles to larger political issues and help them see that they too have a role to play in society. We're not made to just go to work, come back home and slave and do that and pay rent and that's it, right? We have a role to play in society. So we as the youth, we as the new generation, we have the ability to change the world as we know it. And I'm willing to dedicate my life to liberation. Are you Kasama? Dagang Salamat. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for inviting me. My name is Ivan Vega. I'm going to be sharing about my experience as a student organizer and what I'm currently doing now. A little background about myself. I was born in Tlaxcala, Mexico, in a state in Mexico, and I migrated to the U.S. when I was three. I didn't know exactly why we were moving, but growing up in the U.S., my family lived through a lot of fear. Education was a big part of who, of who my family wanted me to become. They wanted, me, they wanted a great future for me. They always told me, you go to school, don't worry about anything. I, there's frijoles here. You go home and um, you'll have enough to eat. And for a long time, life was simple. My parents worked, I went to school. Until one day, my mom told me that she was sick in eighth grade. And when I was in eighth grade, she told me that she had terminal cancer. During this time, I thought, okay, well, we'll get through it. She'll go to the doctor, she'll get healthy, and things will be okay. But when she told me that every doctor she went to told her that she only has six months to live, we went into panic. In an act of desperation, my mom decided to go back to Mexico. And that's when I understood that our immigration status had a big part in our life. She told me, I'm gonna go back to Mexico to get treated, but I don't know if I'll be able to come back. So for two years, I woke up every day thinking, is this the day my mom's going to die? Thankfully, two years after, she made the treacherous journey to come back, cancer free, but not without the trauma of crossing a desert and almost dying there. A year later, I woke up again in a random morning, getting ready to go to school. And I get a phone call from my dad and he said, don't worry, take care of your mom, take care of your siblings, everything's gonna be okay, I'll call you later. I ran out the door to find his truck I turned on with the door open, but he wasn't anywhere in sight. And I knew at that moment that I had picked him up. He didn't have the decency to even let him close the door on his truck. <laughs> A few years after, I graduated from high school. I tried to apply to college, community college, but when I went to my first community college, they told me, you're illegal, you can't be here. I tried to go to another community college and they told me the same thing, you're illegal, you can't come here. I felt so betrayed by this country and I felt so betrayed by the education system. And the only thing that I knew before giving up was at least to reach out to my community. I reached out to a community organization. They gave me the information on how to apply for college. I had to literally print out the state law that, I, 
that gave me the permission to attend community college. And I had to go yell at the admissions office to, to process my application. When I transferred to um, UC Santa Cruz, I didn't have the political education to understand why exactly this was happening. And I didn't have the support that I felt I needed. Thankfully, through the services and documented student services on campus, I was able to meet other undocumented folks with similar experiences. And we all decided that we needed to do something about the situation. We unfortunately did not have the history of the former student organization that was happening then. So we decided to um, start our own club. This club was Beyond Dreams. We started to organize and the main purpose of this club was more for social support. As I, as I moved on to, um, through my courses, I started to learn more about critical race theory. And I started to meet more people that were sharing these ideas with me in the classroom and or student organizing spaces. And they started to share these ideas with me. <laughs> Thankfully, I was able to meet a group of friends who introduced me to, to the idea of creating a class for undocumented uh, called Undocu Studies. We submitted a proposal, we, we researched, and we proposed this, this idea of a student talk class researching what, what, why undocumentedness exists. We submitted our proposal to the sociology department, the LELS department, psychology department, but we all got rejections. And no one on campus really believed in our idea until we met Christine and the Crest department. And they gave us the opportunity to sponsor our, our class and gave us um, the guidance to research, plan, organize. The, this class, um, the purpose of the class is to understand why, why documents have such a strong power in our, in our society. And the biggest thing that I got from the class was understanding that documents and the, the U.S.'s monopoly on documents allows for state-sanctioned violence to happen. Without a, without a paper, the U.S. is able to destroy people's lives, to separate families, to cause harm without any consequences. And these stories often go unheard. For me, creating a space of sharing ideas, building community, sharing political education, that for me is a tool to fight against state sanctioned violence. Now, after graduating, I work with the California State Department of Public Health. Um, and I see the state sanctioned violence that happens there. People are, during the pandemic, services in Spanish weren't being provided, services in other languages were limited certain communities weren't being reached out to. And again, in this new space, I feel really isolated. So I use the skills that I learned at UCSC. I'm starting to outreach to different people I can trust, start sharing ideas on how we can contribute uh, to our work. And I want to continue the legacy of spreading political education and helping our communities. Thank you. Um, oh, the mic's on. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Ileana. Um, I came here in 2019. I'm still here, I'm a third year. Um, I walked right into the BSU literally before school even started, Black Academy, literally in the weeks before school. Um, I guess I cut my teeth in student organizing as a member of the People's Coalition, which was the undergraduate arm of the Cola for All movement that um, sort of did all the things that I 
I've never really said that I was a member of that before now because I was afraid of the ramifications because we did some shit, but it's been a few years. I think it should probably be fine. Um, <laughs> um, so I grew up in Santa Cruz um, feeling a lot like the adults who sort of voted Obama into office, I'm 20, um, had become complacent performative activism and virtue signaling sort of surrounded me while I felt like I was watching them gamble away my future in exchange for things like cheap gas. Um, and the radicals glossed over in my history classes were largely either dead, tired, or institutionalized. Um, and the concessions that had been made to neoliberalism in the 80s and 90s had become largely entrenched as if people had sort of given up on fighting for real transformational change and forgotten that they have to do more than just vote to change their circumstances. Um, and now, fast forward to today, it sort of feels like as a young person, we're living in a backsliding world. I remember when that word dropped and everyone was like, oh, damn. But to someone like me, I thought, you know, maybe nothing really ever changed at the root of it all. Um, which is where a lot of people in my generation are coming from. And I know um, as a member of the BSU, um, especially as I work on basically compiling a comprehensive archive of the history of black student organizing on this campus, I'm constantly reminded of the fact that many of the same demands made by black students over the years since 1969 and even probably before then are still um, unrealized today. Uh, whether their demands for space on campus, staff support, or for funded and vibrant Black Studies Department, um, one thing remained true, which is that few of these demands that would support actually the success of Black students on this campus and in their futures have been met. Few of them have been met. And those few that have been met took a lot of time and effort by students and sacrifice for them to be realized. Um, for example, the demand for Black Studies, which was first made 50 years ago, only last year basically secured a permanent home on this campus, and that was after like a lot of work by Black students to keep that. Um, and all the while, this institution has sort of sold itself as a place dedicating to enacting, dedicated to enacting social change, economic justice, and like preparing students to do that as well. Like they sell themselves as this home of activism and organization, but all that time student organizers have been punished, harmed, vilified greatly for what the university then sort of flips and sells back to us and incoming students and their parents as good trouble. For example, the naming of John Lewis College, um, very nice not what students have been organizing for at all. Um, so we sort of feel justified now as the Black Student Union to expect that in the spirit of that dedication, the administration will take meaningful action to fulfill what Black students have actually been demanding um, to improve our lives at this campus and beyond. Um, and we ask that those students who would like to walk away from today in support of Real student initiatives on campus support the African American Theater Arts Troupe in their fight for resources and space. Yes. Student elections, April 18th to 26th. Um, please help spread the word. BSU's demands are also still in consideration and pressure is critical. Um, for more information, you can contact um, bsu.aat.at at gmail.com we would have tabled but the president is busy doing more organizing stuff that's how it is um but the lack of progress over the last 50 years in fact that students still have to fight for not just equity and inclusion but maybe being like hey why do we have to have a system that requires something like equity in the first place oh, think about it um another example of how movements of oppressed people have been sort of forced to play defense for the last several decades at the expense of making real change. Um, but what I've learned as a student in organizing spaces is that we are powerful 
the administration's attempts to subvert and shut down student organizing is itself evidence of our power. Um, and we need to seek not only to be reactionists, but to be radical and productive in disrupting productivity. Um, and as student organizers with our little cohorts, we start to dream about what the world could be. And with the realization that we have the power to shape a microcosmic collegiate institution comes the knowledge that we could do that with a larger world as well. Um, and that we're sort of uniquely positioned to dream and experiment as young people. Um, and I think that as I took classes in Cress, um, it sort of felt like scales are falling from my eyes. And I think that we are on the brink of a sort of revolution consciousness, but it could go good or it could go bad. And it sort of feels like all the chips of that are on this generation's shoulders. Um, and I basically joined the Black Student Union because I feel like it's my duty to break the inertia and to like seize my future back. So I lend my power, skill, time, and energy to the vast historical community of those who've been fighting for our collective lives and our ability to not just survive, but also live. Um, and everyone has something they can contribute. I just walked in here with my skills at BSU and I was like, here's what I can do. And I just kept working and it's hard work. Um, the job of student organizing, not only thankless, overburdening, emotionally taxing, but also often has negative ramifications on one's student journey and can even come with heavy administrative and legal consequences. Um, and I've seen people kicked out, hurt, leaving the institution. Um, but I think that it's the most frustrating but satisfying work you can do when you're doing something you love, building something for yourself and feeling like you're actually an agent in your own story. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that was a fitting way to close. I really appreciate everything that each of you have had to um, contribute. I just want to start by kind of bringing in some sort of uh, themes that seem to run through all of the talks. Um, and then I'd like to invite, you know, us to kind of just respond to the things that one another said and also kind of maybe ask questions of one another before we open it um, to the, the audience. I think that I'm really struck, um, Ileana, by this issue of agency that you speak about. Um, and it's obviously in the title of, of, the, of the panel today, but I think that this, um, I think that students as agents of, of, of change is both a possibility, but also a kind of threat, right? And I think that um, you spoke about both of those very eloquently. Um, and I really saw certain things that I thought were kind of through lines in the conversations that y'all were having. Um, one of which is, I think, the importance of certain kinds of autonomy. Um, I think the importance of political education. Um, the importance of then what do you do with that political education. Um, the idea of resisting the narrative that um, as you gain this education, that you're supposed to separate yourself from your community rather than go back into your community, right? Um, and all of and then and how that all contributes to um, this idea of what you do with the education in you know outside of the university space, right? And I think that all of those were um, fairly connected issues. I also am struck by the role of discomfort. Right um, in in a lot of your talks, and the fact that you talk about the need to kind of make society uncomfortable, and I'm thinking here about um, John R. Lewis himself, and you know those civil rights protests and so forth, which were about making that system break down. Right, like using the sort of internal logics of the system to break it down in order to create the kind of change that um, that students were fighting for. Um, 
well, I would say students and other young people were fighting for. And so, and then the last thing that was definitely a key um, similarity in all of the talks was this idea of imagination, right? And I mentioned it in my brief remarks, but I think we saw it come through in a lot of the talks, right? This sort of forcing ourselves to really think through what a different world could be, how we could devote our resources differently, how we could organize our society differently. And of course, being consistently told it can't be done that way, but knowing that the way that it exists now has not always existed and therefore, something else can be dreamt up, something else can be imagined, something else can be done differently. Um, so I'd like to just kind of turn things over to, to y'all as a panel to see if you had any comments, um, remarks, questions for one another. Um, and I'm doing that sort of in the spirit of maintaining the need to sort of focus student voices. I mean, I have questions that I can ask, but I, but I really want to make sure that I turn the floor over um, to, to our panelists first and foremost. And then, you know, if necessary, I, I will I'll ask a couple of questions. <laughs> um, but I wanna give y'all the opportunity. I want to continue to um, center your work um, and um, give you an opportunity, I think in many ways to be acknowledged and celebrated for that work, right? Because as um, many of you have pointed out, there are a lot of occasions when neither of those things happened, right? Mm -hmm. So. Does anyone have a point that they didn't get to in their speech? <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, that's another, that's another way that we can, we can jump in. I have that for later. I um, wanted to say that about yours. I really enjoyed hearing that story because, especially the part about language, because I feel like every generation has their language and everyone, there, there sort of become these like hot points where people are like, we're gonna frame it in this way. And then that ends up creating not only a whole new movement, but a whole new way of understanding how we exist. And I think sort of for my generation, I remember the Occupy movement and when all that stuff was going on and Occupy, everything was everywhere. Um, and then there was, the other things like I remember when I was in high school it was intersectionality and like everyone was talking about intersectionality and then when I got to college everyone had started talking about like decolonization and then debating about in what context a word like that could be used mm -hmm. and derivatives of it and so yeah I just really appreciated that because now I have a new new niche definition for a largely used word thank you <laughs> Any other um, comments or questions? Um, just to speak on the point of um, just kind of like agitation and discomfort that was brought up. Um, that was definitely something that was an experience that we had um, when we entered the Ethnic Resource Center because there was this tension that was happening between official uh, uh, orgs of color and us as an autonomous uh, organization. There was this um, discomfort and this fear and this anxiety that their resources would be taken away, that potentially the Ethnic Resource Center would be compromised in some capacity because of um, our actions, which that's, that's an understandable feeling when we um, are coming from these marginalized, historically oppressed and dispossessed communities. Um, and then we're entering these institutions where there's so little for us and those little things that are there feel so like contingent on our own survival. Um, but we also had to kind of make this choice of one honoring and acknowledging that that too was also one of our fears. Like we would have been devastated if we decided to do autonomous organizing and then something got taken away. Um, but we, we also knew that that was a part of the power that the university holds over us. And that was a part of what keeps people from being agitators, what keeps people from maybe escalating tactics to a place that's going to get a certain level of attention. And so, um, you know, sometimes you have to deal with your own discomfort of um, what you are a 
afraid or, or anxious or fearful about and maybe interrogate what that is um, and then make informed decisions based off of, off of that. But that's something that kind of was coming up for me is that um, th this is an uncomfortable process and oftentimes there's no uniform answer of how to approach it. And so you learn a lot about yourselves and each other and your community through the process of trying to organize a democratic space that has like a goal or a vision in mind. Yeah, no, I appreciate um, you reminding us of that, right? Like the discomfort is not just towards systems of power um, or folks who are in powerful positions, but there's also this sort of discomfort of the of the organizing itself and kind of like the new the new knowledges that you have to learn and put into practice and the the challenges. I mean, it is easier to be autocratic and undemocratic, right? Like it's far easier, but when you're in organizing spaces and you're trying to actually engage an actual democratic process, right? And an actual process of, of equity through what you're doing, um, there are always going to be these sort of moments of discomfort. Um, and I think it's important to remember the sort of, you know, discomfort within yourself as you're trying to push past particularly as you re-educate yourself, right? And we push past a, a set of common sense knowledges or even misrepresentations about things that you have to kind of unlearn, right? And sometimes that can be very painful for those of us who come um, from more disadvantaged communities because we've been taught certain things by our parents, right? You know, we've been taught certain things in our community that oftentimes can be reproductions of oppression, right? Um, and then when we sort of begin to unlearn that, you know, there's there's that discomfort of how you mm -hmm. still approach, you know, family, community um, with love, right? Um, but also understanding that there's perhaps been a um, internalization of certain kinds of oppressive logics, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that is part of what, what we also work through. Yeah, I'd like to add on that point of discomfort because uh, discomfort is a very powerful thing. <laughs> it's very powerful in understanding it and it's very powerful in how you react to it, right? Whether that's personal discomfort or systemic discomfort. Um, and I just wanna, it relates back to what I mentioned in my speech when I had these moments of feeling frozen. Um, and what those moments were, were moments of me feeling contradictions in place, especially the contradictions of, you know, the um, kind of sterilized neoliberal uh, propaganda that we get through um, our education system. And then the real life experience that I have in my communities and engaging an activist practice. So in very many of those situations of feeling frozen and uncomfortable, I could have taken easily a more comfortable pathway. <laughs> um, but um, I chose not to. And I think it's really inspiring um, to read the stories of past revolution revolutionaries, past troublemakers, um, who also chose to do the same thing and take that discomfort and have that be a catalyst for some kind of change rather than um, falling into that pressure and just um, giving in, it, giving in to um, a, a neoliberal or a um, uh, normal lifestyle, whatever that's supposed to mean. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you for... Um you know, kind of that reminder, because I think it's, it's, it's really critical and important. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, Yvonne, a bit about, um, because you teased something that I think um, is really important, and I think is something that a lot of our students are going to encounter um, as they sort of leave the UC Santa Cruz space and then think through, um, you know, what post-graduation looks like for them. Right, and I think that you're in this really interesting position of, um, you know, working in public health, working in public health during a pandemic, um, and I think sort of being confronted with the very real forms of state violence that occurs against 
um, the communities that you're from, the communities that you represent, and the disconnect, I think, between um, what is supposed to be kind of a public health service and agency, um, and I think the, the kinds of violences that that agency can enact on the communities that it's actually meant to serve. And you talked a little bit about how um, some of the things that you learned, you know, um, while you were kind of taking classes and as part of your education have been helpful for you to navigate that. I was wondering if you might have more to kind of say about how you incorporate or how you kind of um, deal with that contradiction, right? Um, because I think it's not an uncommon contradiction for many of us who um, have experienced political education, who are interested in questions of, of equity, um, and social justice and then go into certain kinds of careers, particularly uh, public service careers, um, nonprofit careers, et cetera, right? Um, as a part of our desire to continue our work in social justice. So I'm curious about um, if you have anything, you know, that more that you'd like to contribute, I'd be really interested. In, and I think we all could benefit from that perspective. Yes, of course. So. Um... You know, once I made the transition from UCSC back to my community in Oxnard and working with public health, um, it was a huge culture shock um, going from a, a space of where political education is shared and it's encouraged and community or, and all community organizing is encouraged for, um, for social change. And then entering a very bureaucratic system um, a system literally sanctioned by the state um, was very uh, hard to get used to. And I felt very isolated from, just from my support system. So I felt totally disconnected. And going, um, like I mentioned, it's, it's been hard to see how the system is often um, performative where certain programs are created to reach out to some to underserved populations. However, um, you know, the, the, the staff that need, that need to run these programs aren't the correct staff being hired. They're not connected to the communities. They're completely disconnected. For some folks, um, they don't, um, they're not passionate about public service itself. And so that's been some of the hard, most heartbreaking things to see. And coming in as a, a fresh mind um, into the area of public health, just soaking air as much as I can, um, it was overwhelming to not one, uh, learn all the, the clinical side of public health, but also overwhelming in the fact that um, the ideas that I was bringing up to uh, make public health more equitable were being shut down. And um, the, the, my vision of what an equitable like, future uh, for public health, and especially during the pandemic, um, were really not being met. And um, when I tried to create just a network, a support system, people weren't being receptive. So I think that for me right now, I'm in a state um, of similarly trying to create, uh, just share the, the ideas that I, I've learned with some of my, my peers and trying to make that connection and inspire them. It's like, okay, we need to, um, we need to get somebody to do this project that's actually that cares about the population and that's going to commit to helping folks. Um, so, yeah. No, no, thank you. I mean, I think that this is, you know, a dilemma that, that, that many of us find ourselves in and then trying to navigate, um, you know, these um, institutional spaces that, um, oftentimes like, you know, are not as, you know, open to the critique. And of course we, we understand that um, the university is not always open to all of our critiques, um, but, you know, open to, um, open to, I think, being criticized in a certain kind of way, you know, even if not open to changing, right? Um, 
and then moving, I think, into spaces where that openness to those critiques seem to not even be there, right? Um, and so I think that that's um, really interesting. I'm sorry, I cannot see that, but oh, okay, <laughs> right? Um, and so <laughs> I will be getting new glasses soon. Um, but um, um, so I just, as one last question, I want to direct toward Ileana um, because you are a current student here and I think we have current students in the audiences and in the audience. And I'm just really curious about how do you, without kind of like defaulting to kind of neoliberal form of self-care, but like how do you kind of manage the activism with your academic work? And I know part of that is about you know, making the activism an aspect of your academic work, but I'm curious about um, how that that balance, you know, works for you. If you had anything that you would want to share with with the the larger audience, and then I think after Ileana answers, then we'll move to Q and A from the larger audience. Um, well, it's a lot of work. Um, this was a part I didn't really get to in my lightning talk. I was just talking about like. It is, a lot, it is a lot of staying up until 3 a.m. editing the statement document on the shared Google Drive. <laughs> it, it is a lot of where is the megaphone? God, who had the megaphone? I thought it was in your trunk. Um, it's a lot of we're going to Home Depot, like five brown and black short, short people buying like, you know, spray paint and stuff right before closing. <laughs> and so it's a lot of losing sleep. Um, but I guess the way I've sort of managed it after like that crazy time when COVID hit um, was I always put my schoolwork first, um, unless we were, you know, we were on strike. So I was not going to class, um, but now I always put my schoolwork first. Um, and you have to set boundaries. Like it's freshman year, sophomore year, it's cute, but you can, you will burn out. Um, I've seen a lot of people and I myself is like, people will drop off the map. You will not hear from them um, that you're working with. So it gets tough, but I think um, emotionally it can get tough stuff happens, people trauma bond, it's not the greatest, um, which is part of the reason why the BSU fights so hard for mental health stuff on this campus. Um, but yeah, it can get very real out there. People get hurt, um, you lose sleep, grades start to slip, um, people drop out because of how they've been punished or just because they're like, I can't take this goddamn institution anymore. Um, but I think part of the reason I do what I do is because I feel like what all people want is to like be able to live a life where they're able to do the things that they want that make them happy. And it's radical to be happy. People talk about black joy. I didn't really understand it until mid COVID, but just taking time to think about yourself and do the things that you want to do. It's not about making sure there are no pimples on your face or, you know, it's about, you know, some things don't happen. Sometimes you don't write the statement. Sometimes you don't show up to the event. Sometimes you don't turn in the assignment, C's get degrees, play video games if you want to, do art, go for a walk, um, because it's your life today and you're gonna die eventually. So go lie in the grass somewhere. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. I just wanna conclude before moving to the Q and A really quickly by just, really reiterating just how amazing each of you are as and and both as individuals but also to thank your communities and your and your families and those who have supported you through all of this because you obviously don't get here alone so you know it's it's just to acknowledge that um 
And I just will also say that, you know, we're in a larger societal battle right now around um, the teaching of certain kinds of critical forms of theory. And I think that this is what they're afraid of, right? You know, like this is, you know, like um, the changes that students are making um, both within this institution as well as the way that they move outside the institution is what, you know, it's not, that's what they don't want to see, right? And I think that, you know, we have to, um, yes, I think it's important to point out that a lot of these bans on critical race theory are ridiculous because they're not, no one's actually teaching critical race theory. I think that's an important thing to point out. But I also think it's important to remember that even what they are banning is, in fa even if it's not in fact critical race theory, it's about a, t a different kind of teaching of history, right? It's about a fuller story about what the history of the world is, what the history of the United States is. Mm -hmm. um, and these are things that I think, you know, many in the status quo don't want to see. And that's why we don't want to allow students to have access to these forms of education whether at the K through 12 level or at the tertiary level. So um, that'll be my little spiel for that. Um, and, um, and I'll invite uh, questions from the audience now. Um, hi, I'm Gwen. Um, I'm here representing the UCSC Climate Coalition. I have a question that's very basic. Um, how did you go about outreach for your different organizations? It's something that I've been struggling with um, and, and my coalition has been struggling with. So if I could just get some advice from you guys, that would be amazing. Um, I, I guess I can start as a member of a student organization. My favorite thing is like the two rule. So if you're trying to organize, you know, somebody you you knew, you talk to two people you know, and then you tell those two people to talk to two people they know, goes on, goes on, goes on. And you try to get, you know, some type of contact list together and you can start talking to people, but actually talk to them. Don't just email blast. Um, it's about building relationships in the least networky way possible, where you like actually get to know these people, you're going to be working with them. Um, and yeah, so word of mouth is very strong. Flyering in the quarry also happens. Talking to people in your class straight up, I have sent so many messages to my Zoom group. Hey guys, queer club on campus, Discord link, right? Like, so it's it's just about sort of getting creative with it as well and don't be afraid to just be like hey guys i have a club you know don't be shy because people will forget anyway if you embarrass yourself it's okay yeah i want to double uh double down on the the relationships part that was like a big philosophy of our organizing like i said before um we didn't want to create a, a name for our group and so when people just asked us like oh what's your group called we'd be like oh we're just friends like we're just friends and so people are constantly asking us and i'm like oh that's just my friend and they're like you know oh well are you a part of a collective no we're just friends and we have some goals in mind that we want to work towards and so um relationships being a big one um I think that the, I think Christine uh, sometimes tells this story about a time I like went into a lecture and I told everybody in the lecture that I don't trust them. Um, and but the, the goal is that I wanted to trust them that I, that that we were acknowledging and highlighting that we don't have those relationships that are necessary for change. So sometimes it, uh, friendships and relationships are the core to that. Um, and then also collaborating. What we did is we tried to be as consistent as possible with like our kinds of educational events, and we tried to out reach to different like leaders and orgs to like be a part of actually um, producing what we were creating and not just asking them to show up and be in attendance to it. So I think the more people have um, like an investment in what is actually being created, the more likely they are to show up. Um, and then through that, you know, you, you make a new homie and then that person comes to the meeting and then you get critical race and ethnic studies a few years later, so. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that I would just add, and obviously I'm not a student, um, you know, but um, one of the things that I would just add that I think that um, 
for student organizations right now that you have to keep in mind and be a bit gentle on yourself about is just the effects of the pandemic on student organizing and any kind of organizing, right? Um, when you have, you know, people kind of scattered and around and, um, you know, still managing the event. So I think there's, you know, I think now we're starting to see a little bit of recovery in in various different kinds of social movements, both on campus and off. Um, and I think that, um, you know, so I think be mindful of that as you're trying to navigate that this year as well. You know, just that it's gonna probably be a little less than it would be normally until kind of we um, deal better with uh, this uh, particular pandemic. Any other? questions from the chat, so if you're in the chat, go ahead and uh, submit your questions, and we'll uh, read them out to the audience, or to the speakers. So our first question is from Michelle Hernandez, and she says, hi Ivan, thank you for sharing your experience. I'm wondering what you believe the university can do better to support undocumented students. Do you feel the university has made an honest effort to understand and hear the unique experiences of our, un of our undocumented students? Good question. Um, I think that the university has, throughout the years, have made some good in initiatives and in support of the university. However, during my last year, um, through my internship with the Student Diversity Inclusion Project Program, um, we did some research on the university and the services are being offered with uh, foreign undocumented students. Uh, definitely, we wrote out a, 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 a report. Uh, we found out some of our findings from this uh, study were that um, you know some of the links on the websites were uh, weren't working. Um, the student health office um, wasn't offering enough mental health support for undocumented students, and also that the student health um, uh, staff was not reflective of the student population. So effective uh, mental health support. Um, likely wasn't being met. And we collected um, testimonies from students and sharing, um, gathering their, their testimonies and things that they could uh, they recommend for the universities to improve. So I think that the university is not doing enough. Um, I, students have submitted a report of what they would like and what their demands for things to change. Um, I think that the university needs to clearly listen and take action on student demands. Um, so yeah, I think that the university can do better. You know, are there any other questions from students? And can I also just add to what Yvonne was saying? In the course of um, pulling together an archive of materials for undocu studies, we delved into the history of undocumented student organizing on this campus. There was a, a collective called the Sin Collective, Students Informing Now. And there was an era, you remember that, Chris, back in the day. And there was an, yeah, exactly. And there was an era known as the, un, the underground years. And during that time, it was undocumented students who were at the fore of pushing for services and in lieu of the university furnishing those services, creating mutual aid networks. And so that is where it began. It began from student initiative. Um, yes, would you mind introducing yourself? Hello, my name is Ariel Silva, and I just want to shout out that I'm also a BSU core member. So I work with Ileana. I also want to speak to the greatness of everyone on this panel right now, because as a student organizer myself, I see the effects of all that you have left us, um, not only in your knowledge, but in what you're currently giving right now on this stage and speaking to Xavier Liverman's greatness, because I took his um, Black Studies course. <laughs> I, took to, I took his Black Studies course because um, I'm a first year, my first quarter, and it was one of the most transformative pieces that I've ever, ever, ever experienced in the academic level. And I just wanna ask a question of someone who is currently working on the referendum that is going to be on the ballot April 18th right now and currently working through issues that it's happening with our 
white institution, frankly, because speaking to Eliana's point, we are all exhausted spending our nights till 3 a.m. working on demand statements, working on committees for hiring practices so that all BIPOC and marginalized and queer students on campus can actually thrive, not try to survive here. So I want to ask, now that you have moved past the university's sake of organizing what you see right now, like effects of like your student organizing or what you could possibly offer everyone else that is like working right now of like, well, if you saw something effective that like you did during your time that possibly we could be implementing now that you see there's highlighted a big difference between your organizing time and organizing in a pandemic. Because um, all of the student orgs speaking to, you know, the question earlier, we're experiencing like a radical change, not only in how we can function, but how the outside world just outside of the UC system functions. So thank you. All right, we have another question from Michelle Hernandez, who says, Hi, Eliana, thank you for all your work. During the COLA wildcat strikes, it became clear that faculty played a big role in the protection of student organizing. As we push for necessary trouble, in your opinion, what does it mean for the university to be accountable to those students who go out and get in necessary trouble, especially to BIPOC students who are more vulnerable to policing and administrative harm? Yeah, um, I think I heard most of that question. Um, it was basically like, what's the responsibility of the university to students that got um, punished during COLA, right? I'm going to go with that. Um, there, when we were organizing, we and we were interfacing with the administration, there was basically talk around like, well, when you're doing a strike, you're basically holding the administration hostage um, in a way. And so there were talks about like, you know, kind of a negotiation, which is really messed up because we're freaking paying you, <laughs> first of all. Um, and so there were talks around like trying to get um, I don't know, amnesty for the students that had been punished um, during that time. Uh, one of the big issues we had was surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really creepy moment recently where I don't remember who we were talking to, but they were basically, we were talking um, to someone in administration about um, uh, whether or not police surveillance was going to be towed back. And they were basically like, yeah, we don't need that. We have cameras everywhere now. We put them up while you guys were all not on campus. Sucks to suck. And it's like, oh God, where are those? Like we had drones flying over us during the strike, like taking pictures, like being fought, like followed. Um, so that's one thing <laughs> that's really got to stop <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and I think that's a responsibility that the administration has to its students um is to not surveil us um another one i'd say would be like just give more support to students who are like on on the brink of failing out of the university um there's all this stuff about you know there's student support and they talk about it but it's like they kind of i watch people kind of get bullied out basically um and it was really messed up um so i'd say just yeah and, and we've talked to the university um i was on uh the the committee for community safety um where we were talking about basically all the stuff that was needed to happen after um 2020 and one of the things that was being talked about was basically like um the administration has a responsibility and this is something i actually wrote and they put through and now i just got to make sure they don't turn it into a neoliberal nightmare which is basically just like the administration has a responsibility to interface with student organizers before it gets to the point where we have to break laws to get what we want and in the first place why are you making it so that we have to get to that point 
so that we have to put your money in jeopardy so that we can get what we want and that's actually what you're punishing so um some follow through on that would be nice um i wish i had more in-depth details on how that's going but they're in the purpose of reviewing it right now so just so real quick, Claire, there were like two questions that were, okay, I just wasn't sure which one we were gonna answer. Yes, we didn't really answer the, the other question. So if y'all had anything to say to that question around. Real quick, just in terms of what I felt was effective um, was again, the, the autonomous part um, when it needed to be. And then there's a, there's a shift that happens if you're trying to institutionalize something where you can only be so autonomous. We. Uh, you know, so I think there's a part of it where, you, you know, you kind of start off with your, your vision and the, the kind of raw, like, collective energy of, like, undergraduates. Um, but if there's a larger vision of institutionalizing something, you do need your uh, allies um, uh, in faculty, you do need your graduate mm -hmm. student allies. Um, the next phases of CREST being um, realized wouldn't have been possible, hadn't it been for the March 2nd, um, you know, retreat to the Ethnic Resource Center, that's what got the attention of graduate students um, and got the attention of faculty of color. And that was what created kind of the organizational body that was doing the legwork to actually institutionalize it. So those relationships are very important and you just gotta be strategic about which relationships you build and with whom. Um, thank you, thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Ray Diaz. I'm a first year here at UCSC, and I want to thank you all for your presentations. It really means a lot, you know, being a first year, not knowing so much history of uh, the student movements that have happened here on campus. And as a member of the Worker Student Solidarity Coalition and Woo! Student Housing Coalition, I guess a couple of questions that I would have for you all would be, what would you tell students who are afraid of the retaliation from this university, being that it has so much history in trying to suppress student voices? Um, so yeah, that's my question. Um, okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, I think the first thing I'd say is like, if you're scared, that's completely fine. Nobody, I, it's about your level of comfort with being uncomfortable. I would never ever tell someone who's scared of getting physically harmed or is not in a position where they're able to get arrested it's you give what you can we're all here hopefully to graduate and if if you're not willing to put that on the line or you legitimately can't some of us have stuff that's beyond us that means you can't do this like you know that's fine i would never ever tell someone that they have to do that um I think it's about also building a group of people where you feel like people are gonna have your back. Mm -hmm. Like if you get arrested, there is somebody who's gonna hop in their car and follow you around to make sure they don't spirit you between like, you know, three different holding centers until we lose track of you for 72 hours. Like, so it's about also having that structure behind you in the movement and learning what might happen and being prepared for that, you know, we had people taking names of all the SWAT people on the other side of the road. You know, we had people who were in contact with lawyers. We had all that. And that was because we had so many people who had experience with this, that they were able to prepare for those things. And when stuff did go down, it was able to be handled pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's, you should never ever like tell someone, oh, you've got to do this. Oh, you got to do this for the movement or, oh, you suck. You know, like that's, that's not what it's about at all. And um, it's about taking care of each other. And I'd say just, it's about really trusting the people that you're with as well, that they're going to have your back and that you will have theirs. Can I add to that? Um, I think uh, something that 
Um, this is like as a practical thing that we've done with like actions before um, is a risk assessment. You should always consider what that looks like because it is true like that, you know, like making discomfort in whatever way um, is going to get um, attention. And we just talked about surveillance on the campus. So they know, <laughs> for example, they know that this event is happening <laughs> and they have our names. So, you know, it's about assessing what risks are necessary to take and what, as, as mentioned beforehand, what are people comfortable in doing? Um, like, for example, don't um, take an unnecessary risk that you individually decided to do. Um, because especially if you're working with a collective of people or an organization, um, I think like a tendency for student organizers that you mentioned is kind of like this, this tendency to, to, to want to jump in, right? And uh, seize a moment and, um, you know, even kind of like how we sensationalize activism. Um, uh, have that moment where you're on the megaphone and you're saying something and people are cheering for you or whatever. Um, <laughs> but um, a lot of organizing in reality is painstaking conversations, discussions, relationship building, and assessment. That's why I actually really, I didn't get to answer it, but I love the question on outreach um, because uh, no one thinks about that. That's never put in the activism documentary. Um, <laughs> you know, that's never, you know, that's never, that's never discussed. Like the painstaking, um, work that it takes to build relationships with people, understand their comfort, do the political education, etc. So always um, communicate that, right? And make sure that you hold unity with people. Yeah, I had a full page I didn't get to in here about how, like, all the boring stuff that isn't sensationalized, that isn't flashy, all that reproductive work, of productive and reproductive work where well, you're not the person with the megaphone you're the person right. like you know what I did all my first year was I wasn't on the megaphone I was writing stuff and handing it to the people with the megaphone or like carrying water so <laughs> like, very um, important <laughs> yeah um so it's it's all that not flashy stuff that's really the bread and butter because if you don't have any type of structure there's no way to, org if you're not organized, you do not have the capacity to organize. If someone doesn't have that list of emails, ain't nobody showing up to the protests. Like nobody goes and prints those flyers. So it's really, it's about the hard work and getting people who are nerdy and dedicated enough to want to go mm -hmm. do that stuff. Um, and it's not fun all the time. It's not fun most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I think really, impressing that on people because you will get hundreds of diverse students who will show up for an action but you will get many many fewer of those who are willing to stay there and put in the work and usually those people come from the people who need to do that like the students of color women of color queer students who were like this isn't a game <laughs> so it's it's Yay, work, you know, do a study group for working. <laughs> if I could add to also to your question, I think that uh, part of the outreach would also be getting to know your team. Like, who do you have right now that's willing to do the work and really getting to know their strengths and the weaknesses? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, for example, I'm a very, I'm an introvert. I'm very quiet. So I would like help write documents or help create a flyer. Um, and getting the folks who are more extroverted and more willing to, or, or who are, who get to build uh, relationships easier, making them do the presentations and outreach, um, and also learning how to delegate the tasks to make sure that folks don't get burnt out at the beginning of your outreach, because that happens often.
Um, sorry. Um, so uh, just to conclude, I just want to add to the, the things that have been said by the panelists, and I'm sorry if my microphone is not working. Um, but I just wanted to add, like, when you do any kind of action, right, there's, there's, there's a lot of background planning that has to be done, and part of it has to be um, understanding that you may come under certain kinds of state violence or surveillance and then figuring out who is able to be able to un undergo that right and then how do you do that if someone does come you know um under that so that you have like lawyers that you've already contacted in advance you have people you know following the the police when people are being pulled away so you know what detention center they're being taken to those are things that are really important. And that's the kind of drudgery, not so sexy work, right, of organizing. So um, I just would like to conclude, a couple of comments came um, through online. And so we just would like to read them out as a sort of conclusion. And then um, I'll turn things over to Flora. All right, so our first comment comes from Sam Dennison, who says, as a clear alum who graduated in 1982, I wanna thank you for the 50 year struggle for ethnic studies. Even on graduation day in 82, students were holding a hunger strike and many of us speaking at one or another ceremony called out to the chancellor and admin for denying tenure to faculty of color and the failure to fund ethnic studies. The struggle is long and you may begin as a student, but that's only the beginning, right? Peace se puede, my friends. <laughs> And then our second comment is from Moses Massenberg, who says, <laughs> <laughs> What up, Moses? <laughs> I never thought we would live to see any of us on stage giving context to a movement we fully anticipated to be swept into the wasteland of institutional memory that rides on the toxic underside of UC Santa Cruz. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And yes, the movements, emphasis on the S, on campus were necessarily decentralized. Though some black students understood what some of us meant by the movement language, the University of California of institutionalized white supremacy at, at Santa Cruz, we had more conservative students of color on campus as well. We had students who worked for a system that engaged to further the PTSD we already had from growing up in Eastwood, Watts, Compton, and prisons. Long live our efforts. Long live our, uh, long live our efforts in the spirit of ancestor alum, Dr. Huey Percy Newton. He is us. No disrespect to ancestor John Lewis, but Huey's name should be elevated. We still have a long way to go, don't we? <laughs> you know, I just wanted to say one thing and you know, before handing it over to Flora, which is that the students who are on the stage and Elias who could not make it were all instrumental in developing from the ground up areas of study on this campus insisting on the centrality of political education even within formal institutionalized educational spaces and they materialize these courses that are a legacy Philippinex historical dialogue is the longest running continuously offered ethnic studies course on this campus, it turns 20 this year. And it's because of students. And I wanna say another thing too, which is that the ways in which areas get funded in terms of faculty positions is that departments have the decision-making power. This campus remains 67% white on the level of faculty even though it is now an HSI and an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution, even though Native students and Pacific Islander students are woefully underrepresented. But I wanna say something, even though there's been this enormous demographic shift on the level of student, faculty who are 67% white get to decide what areas of study come into being. These students fought for courses that are part of a legacy of this institution. It came from the ground up. Please join us in another round of applause to thank our incredible presenters tonight. We would also like to express 
our appreciation to all of you in this room and online for showing up and being part of the conversation. In the digital handout, we acknowledge the many people who made this evening possible. Our deepest gratitude to them all. There's a couple additions that I wanted to highlight. I wanted to thank the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for their added support of this evening's event. And I wanted to express a special thanks of gratitude to the organizational force behind this entire event series, Wendy Baxter, who came out of retirement to support the efforts at John Lewis College. And as has been announced, Friday, May 6th is the next event to look forward to in what I'll call the continuation of this series. And that is the John R. Lewis College dedication celebration. And let it not just be a dedication of John R. Lewis College, but let it be a rededication of College 10's theme of social justice and community and the continued action that is needed on this campus and in our society at large. So please join us in the quarry, tell all your friends, two by two by two by two. Um, tell all your friends to join us. Doors open at three o'clock. The event starts at four o'clock. You will be inspired, we hope, to continue this action that has been started by many of the students here on this stage. Um, so thank you. Check out our website for more information, um, and we look forward to seeing you on May 6th. And as a reminder for those of you in the room here today, um, we have some organization groups that are still tabling right after this event, so please um, check them out in our Rotunda hallway area. We have ranging from student organizations mentioned in the talks tonight to the Center for Racial Justice to the John R. Lewis Dedication Committee, um, information about that upcoming celebration that I mentioned, so please stop by those tables. And then also for, for those of you in person, when you're done visiting the tables, uh, food is grab and go due to COVID protocol, but please pick up a snack box on your way out. Thank you again, all of you here present today, all of you online. Thank you again for joining us. This is the conclusion of the Necessary Trouble series to commemorate the naming of John R. Lewis College. Thank you all. <laughs>